Welcome back. I'm your host, Charlotte Stebbing Mills, and today I'm diving into all things burnout what it is, what it isn't, some of the red flags, what people he uh, think helps burnout and actually does more harm than good. I'm going to be talking about the different types of burnout, what's happening inside of the body, and what happens if we don't address it. And of course, I'm going to be speaking about the root cause of burnout and how to overcome burnout itself. So this is an episode where you can sit back, relax, and let the topic of burnout wash over you. Because let's be honest, burnout can be quite a heavy topic, can't it? Especially if you think that you're experiencing burnout or on the verge of it. So there's going to be a lot of gems. So feel free to make notes in your journal, but just know that the information shared today can set you free and help you overcome burnout. You're in safe hands. I've been specializing in stress relief and burnout for over a decade and been in the health and wellness space for almost 20 years. So let's dive in. In 2023, a Cigna Healthcare Wellbeing survey revealed that 98% of people experience at least one symptom of burnout. So to visualize this, I'm going to invite you to kind of close your eyes and just imagine your friends and family, right? Just imagine the people you care about the most. And just consider that four out of five of them could be grappling with some kind of feelings of exhaustion or overwhelming stress. Just pause for a moment and breathe that in. Visualize the people you care about, the people that are in your life day to day, whether it be colleagues, family members, friends, maybe even strangers on the street. Right? Four out of five of them might be struggling. Right. And there's a lot out there that says that burnout is a silent epidemic. Right. And I'd argue massively that it's not so silent. It's a massive issue and we need to get on top of it as a society, because in fact, one of the precursors of burnout is stress. And stress is responsible for 75 to 90 percent of diseases, according to the World Health Organization. Right. But you and I know that stats can be skewed for anyone that wants to make a case for or against something. Right. So let's go ahead and dive into the reality, perhaps that you're experiencing instead. So have you ever or do you experience any of the symptoms I'm about to ask you on a regular basis? So what about physically? Do you notice fatigue showing up? Maybe you're always feeling tired, even after a good night's sleep. Maybe you experience some form of insomnia or sleep disruption. So that could include things like falling asleep or staying asleep, right, when you actually do get off. Maybe you experience headaches, muscular tension in the body. Maybe you experience gut issues, right? Maybe stomach problems or you feel a bit nauseated sometimes. Or maybe you get sick frequently and your immune system might need a little bit of extra support. What about emotionally, right? What about some form of emotional exhaustion? Do you feel like you're just drained and depleted sometimes? Do you feel like your capacity to cope with everyday stresses is actually being quite stretched? Maybe you feel a bit cynical about life. Maybe you feel detached or not as connected as what you once were. Perhaps you are feeling like the things that used to bring you joy don't anymore. Maybe you get irritable. I know that's definitely a symptom I've experienced before, maybe anxiety, even as far as depression. Sometimes, and worst cases, it can feel like a sense of hopelessness as well. So that is obviously the physical and emotional symptoms that I'm curious for you to reflect on, to see if you've experienced or experienced on a regular basis. But what about your behaviours? Have you noticed like a decrease in your performance? Right? Maybe you're not as efficient as what you once were at work or even at home. Maybe you feel like you're withdrawing a little bit from society. Maybe you would opt for, you know, a lot of nights in rather than any social time, right? What about procrastination? Is this heightened more than the average for you? What about you leaning into more escapism behavior? You know what I'm talking about. Things like substances, right? Perhaps having a few extra glasses of wine at the end of the day. Maybe you're leaning into gaming or just watching mindless TV, right? Maybe you're distracting yourself and going out all of the time. So opposite of the um, isolation and the withdrawal that I mentioned. Maybe you're just noticing that you're neglecting your self-care, right? Such as exercise or eating the right foods, even down to things like brushing your teeth, right? I wonder if you can reflect on some of those symptoms and just ask yourself are any of those prevalent in your life right now 
Now, please don't worry. If you are experiencing one or more than one of these symptoms, or you know somebody else that is, then please know that these are okay. Then they're just warning signs, right? However, if these signs are being experienced over a prolonged period of time and becoming chronic issues, then these are when they become red flags. They are your call to act now and seek recovery and support. Think of these red flags like traffic lights. Ignoring them and like running a red light might seem insignificant at the time, but they can obviously lead to dangerous consequences like a car crash, right? So acknowledging and responding to the signals within yourself, these red flags, it's crucial for you to have a safe journey ahead in health and in life. Now, these red flags don't necessarily mean that someone's in a state of burnout. Right. These symptoms can also be associated with our physical and mental health issues, but catching them sooner rather than later will help your well-being. And if we don't and we actually ignore these symptoms, they will get louder and they will get more demanding. Trust me, I can speak from both personal and professional experience here. Professionally, I joined the world of health and wellness in 2005, specializing in cardiac rehab and prevention. Right? working to transform the lifestyles of people who had experienced heart attacks and strokes. They were living typically high stress lifestyles. And I work closely with the NHS in the UK to bridge the gap between medical and commercial health and wellbeing services. And that's what actually brought me to the Middle East. And I went on to move into very senior leadership positions where I would lead teams of over a thousand people across the UAE, Saudi Arabia, uh, Kuwait, Jordan, um, and, and I was delivering and creating programming for the betterment of well-being, right? And ironically, the betterment of well-being behind closed doors, I was then experiencing burnout to the point of hitting rock bottom. And I know the struggle of what it is to kind of get back up again. So let me set the scene for you. It's 2014 and I'm flying to five different countries in the course of a month, often two or three within one week, responsible for lots of different projects and people, including myself. I'm showing up with a smile on my face. I'm giving as much as I possibly can to the people around me and to the projects around me. And I was burying myself in more and more responsibilities, which made me feel like I should be thriving. Right. But no matter how hard I push myself, that feeling of accomplishment never really came. So at the same time, though, I was exhausted. I didn't know if I was coming or going. I wanted to really like engage with life, but there was something in me that was almost like holding me back. Like there was this filter or this, this, this thing between us, me and life. I was literally just going through the motions and everything was feeling distant. I felt disconnected somehow in all areas of my life. My mind was constantly racing. I felt wired at night as I went to lay down. My mind was just like on all of the time I barely had the energy to see friends or family my days have become survive the day try to sleep rinse and repeat that was basically it I knew I was exercising less and I was eating more of what I know wasn't good for me but what was strange is that I didn't really do anything about it even though I was somewhat aware of how I was feeling until one night in my apartment in Abu Dhabi that's where I was living at the time everything just came to a head I was coming home from a normal day at work I went straight to my room I was living in like a, a shared apartment at the time and I remember closing the door I then closed the curtains and I dropped down to my knees on the floor and I literally wept for hours after a while I kind of summoned the energy to get off the floor and I moved to the bed from the floor right and I curled up in the fetal position and at the time I climbed onto the covers and I, I didn't know what was happening to me. I was scared, right? The thoughts in my mind were just intense. They were whizzing around. I was overwhelmed by this impending sense of doom I had. I felt sad. I just felt sad in my core and I was absolutely sobbing. My hands were shaking. And naturally, I was like rocking myself in this attempt to numb myself, to be honest, because those feelings were, were hard and heavy. My eyes were just like red raw and my head was throbbing. And all I wanted was a way out. I was desperate to stop feeling this pain, to stop feeling this exhaustion and this, this heightened emotion and this just, this just this absolute depletion of this life force energy that I once had. I needed relief, but my mind continued to spiral into a dark, dark place that I never wish for anyone. 
out of nowhere, I remember pulling out a scarf, a really long scarf, this white and blue scarf, I can picture it now, um, that I had, and I fixed it up onto the top of wardrobe that I had in the room, and I slowly began to thread a noose at the bottom of that scarf. And I remember I, I collapsed in tears again. So these are really ugly tears, those breathless tears that come with this sheer sense of defeat, and it wasn't pretty. I stood up slowly and began to tighten the scarf around my neck. I can feel it now as I, as I say this to you. And I've never, I don't think I'll ever forget that feeling, right? This taut texture of the scarf, scarf on my skin and these wet tears streaming down my face and this, this heaviness and this darkness that I felt in that room and like the room was closing in on me. And for me, that was it. That was going to be my way out. I went to take what I thought would be my last breath and I inhaled a surge of energy just shook me to my core and I don't know where this energy came from but it shook me to my bones I immediately stepped down and pulled the scarf away from my neck and the wardrobe and I literally just like burst into a new version of tears that I never experienced before it was this cocktail of shame disappointment more exhaustion relief guilt gratitude weirdly some fear confusion essentially I was powerless to let go um, and it was like this flood, this flood of emotion. That's the best way I can describe it. It was like it just washed over me and it was almost like I there was nothing else I could do. But this emotion was a sign, right? There was something that this energy that kind of pulled me down, right, and brought me back to myself in many ways. As emotional as I was, I was coming back to some semblance of me with the clarity that obviously I needed severe help at that time. I was burned out, right? Completely burned out. And for the first time in my life, I reached out and asked for help, right? I asked for help from a, from a therapist. Um, I was too scared to pick up the phone, so I sent them an email um, and because I wasn't sure anybody could help me. I felt like I was completely in this alone. I didn't know anybody else that experienced burnout, especially the, in the way that it was showing up for me. Fortunately, she responded and I went to see her the following day. And that was obviously a catalyst for a healthier future in all the ways imaginable. In hindsight, though, I feel like it was obvious now, right? I should have seen it coming. I was easily triggered. I was defensive. I was experiencing emotional outbursts. I was withdrawing. I was anxious when I didn't used to be. I was replaying situations and conversations in my mind and uh, taking everything personally. I was sabotaging myself at every opportunity, eating emotionally. You name it. I was a psychologist, perfect case study at that time. But that's the thing, right? When we're in it, it's really hard to see it sometimes, let alone to be able to do something about it. And the crazy part about all of this was that to the outside world, I seemed fine. I seemed okay. But actually hitting that rock bottom was the reality check that I needed, right? It was a wake up call because now I get to be here with you and spend my days helping other people to make sure they don't burn out to that extent again. And I truly believe that had I known then what I know today and what I'm sharing with you today, I don't believe I would have gotten to that point. See, from my work, right, in all of those years that led up to that burnout, I knew about mindset. I knew about the physical and the nutritional elements of well-being, but I neglected the emotion and the mental health piece. It just wasn't part of the education system back then. And it was something that I had to find out the hard way. And I hope with you watching this is that you don't have to find out the hard way either. So obviously from there, I then went on to study from the absolute best people that exist in this space and fast forward to 2024 i'm obviously the co-founder of the wellness theory which specializes in stress relief and collaborative workplace well-being solutions and i say that because like mastering the art of healing and high performance at the same time is no small feat and i know how overwhelming it can be so I just want to be the first person to tell you that there is a way forward even if you've reached kind of the darkest holes of burnout that exist and it's so important to know that everyone is at risk burnout does not discriminate right it's not for weak people it's not for people who just don't know how to do life right it, there's often a lot of shame or embarrassment around burnout but i want you to know that it's more common than you than what you would think right and at every level of the game i've spoken to 
18 year olds that are burnt out. I've spoken to senior leaders that are burned out and every everyone and every person in between. Um, you know, so there's no discrimination here. So if you're experiencing burnout, please know that you're not alone. And remember, four out of five people have experienced at least one symptom of burnout. So let's talk about what burnout is not, because this word gets thrown around a lot. So burnout is not stress or extreme stress, right? So stress can sometimes be a precursor to burnout if it's chronic stress. However, everyday stress, okay, is a normal response to challenging situations. And even in moments of crisis, it's the moments of crisis. It's not prolonged, right? So it's okay to have that stress response firing. We want that. That's good for us. But the reality is like, it's not burnout, right? Burnout has a complex bunch of factors that lead to it, right? And stress or extreme stress is not one of them. Feeling temporarily fatigued is not burnout. Feeling tired after a hard week or a busy week or a challenging project is not burnout. Laziness or loss of motivation is not burnout. Okay. If we are experiencing cynicism and uh, like detachment from our daily life and it's showing up as laziness or lack of motivation, then it could be a symptom of burnout. However, laziness on its own or just not feeling motivated on its own is not burnout. Boredom is not burnout. Okay, simply being bored is not the same as being feeling detached or feeling overly cynical about one situation. Clinical depression is not burnout. Okay, clinical depression, again, there are many different contributing factors and they are not the same as burnout. If you're depressed, it doesn't mean you're burned out. And if you're burned out, it doesn't mean that you're depressed. Okay, we need to explore what else is going on on underneath the surface, but one does not boil down to the other. Burnout is not a natural part of high pressure or challenging jobs. Challenging situations within a job role or a certain time of life is natural. We're going to experience natural challenges, but it does not equate to burnout. A single cause, a single cause is not burnout. This is basically kind of my point here is one thing doesn't equate to burnout. Typically, there are multiple factors going on at once. OK, so, for example, it's not always emotional. And it's not always physical. It's usually a combination of those symptoms that we mentioned earlier together. So just pause for a moment and ask yourself if you're actually burned out. Or are you perhaps just experiencing one of those points that I've just mentioned because it could just be that it's a momentary challenge in your life or momentary tiredness in your life or momentary behaviors that you've noticed just take a moment and reflect on that and check with yourself because re recognizing what burnout is not is essential for understanding its nature and for you like how you can relate to what you're experiencing so burnout was first recognized in 1974 as a psychological diagnosis by Herbert Rodenberger, and he defined it as a physical or mental collapse caused by overwork or stress. And later, the World Health Organization defined burnout to be occupational phenomenon and suggests that it should not be applied to experiences in any other areas of life. Now, According to World Health Organization, it's a psychological and physical condition resulting from chronic workplace stress that's not been managed. However, I would agree with that statement if it wasn't isolated to the workplace. So I really believe that it's a psychological and physical condition resulting from chronic stress that has not been successfully managed. Because if it was true that it was only in the workplace, how do we explain the burnout of people outside of the workplace? Right. Based on my experience, and I would really argue that it's not isolated to work only. I've worked with burned out people who do not have jobs. Right. So for the sake of modern day well-being, I would urge us to open our minds and consider that anyone can experience burnout regardless of their profession. And there are many, many different types of burnout. But today I want to share with you four types of burnout to be aware of that tend to be the most dominant that we see in this day and age. The first one being emotional burnout. 
This is the exhaustion, the frustration, this feeling of being drained all of the time. It is you may be struggling to regulate and, and manage your emotions, maybe heighten mood swings, uh, reduce the ability to actually cope with stress that you were once able to cope with. And that nature of being more cynical and detached, like I mentioned earlier, and maybe a bit more pes pessimistic about life. Now, emotional burnout can be strongly associated with crisis burnout, which is when something intense is happening in your life and the knock-on effect of that crisis continues. It is also associated with discriminatory burnout. So anybody that experiences uh, racism or any other kind of discrimination, could that over a period of time can start to burn us out as well, particularly from an emotion standpoint. It's also heavily linked to relational burnout. If there are certain people in your life, in your world, in your workplace that are there for a prolonged period of time and there are these constant challenges, sometimes relational burnout can be a thing as well. So those are always come under the umbrella of emotional burnout as well. Now, the second dominant type of burnout we see is physical right? Like I said earlier, all of these are intertwined, but physical burnout is associated to the chronic stress that happens inside the body, right? So this is the fatigue, the headaches, the tension, the sleep disruption, the um, changes in appetite. This is the psychosomatic symptoms that can start to show up. This is your immune system being weaker. This is you getting sick more frequently. This is you starting to perhaps notice changes externally on your body or even the way that you're feeling when it comes to your energy levels as well. These are all physical um, symptoms, obviously, of, of physical burnout. Work-related burnout, I would say, is definitely up there within the top four. So work-related burnout, and these obviously are linked to demands of stresses in the workplace. So overwhelmed by the workload, um, perhaps a loss of control in the workplace or lack of autonomy in your tasks and um, not being able to actually think and behave and do what it is that you feel like you want and can bring to the table. There can be a perceived lack of support from colleagues or from bosses as well. So this type of burnout um, obviously is from that prolonged exposure to chronic work-related stresses as well. And that does include things like remote work as well. This can also be associated with academic burnout. So people that are studying, right, students potentially there. Uh, volunteer burnout or activism burnout. Okay, this is also a form of uh, work-related burnout entrepreneurial burnout as well and then we have specific industry types of burnout as well like technology sales teaching um creatives the arts social work parental burnout even these would all come under the work related burnout as well so as i'm sharing these i want you to again just pause and reflect in your journal and perhaps consider do you need to go and explore some of these specific types of burnouts because they do have their own nuances and some of those nuances can lead to a slightly different recovery strategy for you as well. But the fourth one, the fourth most dominant burnout that we're seeing more and more of right now is digital burnout. And this is that constant connectivity, right? Always being connected to devices like your smartphone, your laptop, social media, Right. All of these different things and it's making it a lot harder to just disengage and have some processing time for ourselves. Related to this is information overload. Right. So exposure to these constant streams of information, notifications, it, it's enough to overwhelm anyone. Right. Unless we are taking control of it. So there's so much information to process that sometimes it's just too much for, for our cognitive brain. Right. So it gets exhausted and then we can't actually focus. I would say social media comes under that digital burnout massively. This excessive use of, of social media and scrolling, not only can the, the act of that and being in close proximity to screens all the time could obviously affect us physically, but the psycho psychology of comparing ourselves to others, um, dealing with online conflicts, different sort of pressures to be able to maintain this curated life, right? Living your best life on social media and things like this, that all contributes to this emotional exhaustion. Workload is a big part of it as well, right? It's a lot of the time we're not only perhaps scrolling on things like social media or on our devices, consuming more and more information, even if you're reading the newspaper on your phone or on your device, 
um we're also having a workload from work right for those people that are working now this is becoming more and more apparent in the workplace because there's like obviously more and more emails coming through virtual meetings coming through and we've seen obviously an increase in that since the pandemic um, and this constant flow of digital communication which is making it a lot harder for us to have boundaries everything else has become very efficient right but our attention span hasn't right if anything our attention span has, has got worse digital burnout can also include things like gaming right sometimes one of those escapism behaviors to avoid how we're feeling can sometimes be to play games playing games on your phone right i remember going on a a, a silent retreat it was the first silent retreat i'd done and so they take away your phone and everything else and this we all got our phones back on the on the very last day when we was about to leave and this lady she got her phone and she just immediately started playing candy crush and i was just so confused i'm like you've just had 10 days in in peace in quiet you've been disconnected from family and friends and and conversing with human beings and your first go-to was to go play candy crush like it, it just doesn't make any sense in my mind however there'll be something going on with her that is is really got this strong yearning for for the game right and so it's really important for us to recognize where our focus is going because even like learning now that plays a massive role in our um digital burnout if this is what we're experiencing right because if you're studying something often now reading something is all on a device of some sort okay and then on top of that i'm definitely guilty of this is multitasking right so you probably got a certain number of tabs open you're working on one thing over here and then you're doing something over there and then you get notification over here and it's very easy if we're not careful to miss certain things right and also to miss that again processing time and this ability to be able to focus ourselves as well so just take a moment and ask yourself if any of those sound familiar to you and make a note in your journal and if so you i know you're going to want to know what to do about it right it's really important to know where you are to know how to move forward next all right so there's also a few misconceptions about what can help burnout which can do more harm than good and i want to share those with you before i jump into a real strategy of how to overcome burnout now the first thing is that taking a break will solve burnout right now taking a break would definitely be beneficial okay however if it's just temporary it's not going to be enough right if we take a two-week holiday and then go back to work and everything else is still there then when we're just putting like a band-aid over a bullet wound right we're not actually addressing the nature of burnout itself we need to look at those systemic issues that are going on so taking a break can help it can be a great first step however it is exactly that is a first step not a solution the other thing that is a common misconception around burnout is that the way to overcome it is to ignore our emotions and our feelings in relation to it, right? And, and that's in all domains, right? So people say, oh, I'm stressed out about work. Or I'm feeling really burned out. Okay, take two weeks off of work. And then when you go back to work, uh, just turn your phone off when you come home um, and focus somewhere else, focus on your relationships. And again suppressing the emotions that are related to that heightened stress over a prolonged period of time actually worsens the stress those red flags those, those red traffic lights will just keep on jumping if we try to ignore them we also have and this is a myth here as well is that we think that being on perhaps technology or taking a break from whatever you've got going on in your daily life to go on your phone is actually helping you but in fact it's going to be hindering you a lot more and contributing to burnout rather than actually helping you um, overcome it because we become very over reliant on digital digital devices okay and it's creating more disconnect okay so believing that the solution is, to, is almost distraction to some extent is also going to do more harm than good another common thing i hear people say when it comes to burnout is like i feel like i just need to go and live in a cabin in the woods and just be on my own for a while, right? And over isolating yourself is not a solution. Again, it can be a good first step. However, it's not going to help in the long term get to the root cause of burnout itself, okay? So 
those are just a few of kind of the misconceptions. So pause again for a moment and just check if you're falling into any of those because they will be well-intentioned behaviors. However, they can sometimes be traps. And I know I'm falling into those traps, so don't worry, it's very natural, but hopefully you know which ones to avoid and you can start to make a note of them in your journal. So if we buy into some of these old misconceptions and don't address it, there could be consequences like mental illness, health conditions, strained relationships, loss of belonging, severe drop in performance, which can then result in job losses or financial strain as well. So the best way to overcome burnout is to actually understand how you got here and what has been going on and what's going on on the inside the body. We didn't just wake up one day and we were burned out. It happened gradually over time. And this buildup is a bit like being on a roller coaster. And there are six stages on this roller coaster that lead to burnout. So the first stage is what we call autopilot. Believe it or not, you've actually been on this kind of roller coaster since the day you were born, right? You you have this inbuilt guidance system so that we can uh, remain safe and protected at all times, right? It's our primal survival mechanism. And we need to make sure that we are living on autopilot so that we are naturally absorbing stress, letting it go, absorbing stress, letting it go, right? So therefore, we have these re repetitive patterns on a daily basis, like physical, mentally, and emotionally. So for example, we will get like physically tired or hungry and then we eat or we go to sleep, right? Very, very natural. But what tends to happen is if we don't pay attention to what's happening on autopilot, if we don't assess what's happening on autopilot, we go into stage two, which is the onset of stress, right? Now this can be that we've uh, not paid attention to some of our kind of daily needs, or it can be that something tragic happens in someone's life, right? So loss of a loved one, being in an accident, losing a job, uh, having difficulties at work, starting a new job, entering new relationships or health challenges, moving house. All of these different things can create this trigger, right? This onset of stress that we might start to experience. And you'll know when you experience these because it's when our muscles tense up or it's when we uh, feel our heart rate increasing or we feel a bit more irritable or tired or we have trouble sleeping and we all have times like that. But what happens when we have that onset of stress, we then need to learn how to navigate it, which is stage three, right? So navigation is when we actually take control of our stress response, right? It's when we decide how we're going to respond to this stress. Are we going to notice that we're having trouble sleeping and do something about that? Or are we going to um, recognize that our heart's beating extra fast or we're making poor decisions and do something constructive about it? This is where the navigation phase is really, really important, right? Because after the initial shock of a stressful event, we want to kind of come down and this is our opportunity. This is our window to actually start to create change, okay? But this is sometimes where people start to go wrong, right? They start to adopt unhealthy coping mechanisms to that stress instead of healthy ones. So they might start to ignore the signs and symptoms of stress, right? They might start to pretend that everything's okay. They might start distracting themselves from how they feel. They might start to use substances, right, to distract themselves from what they're experiencing. They might lash out at loved ones, right, as their form of expression of how they're feeling. They might actually start to withdraw from others, like we mentioned earlier. They might start to drop their expectations of themselves, right, and start believing that it's normal to suffer. These are all unhealthy ways of navigating stress, which unfortunately then leads our, our internal system to stage four, which is what we call poor adaptation. So this is when we've had the stressful event, we have then not responded to it in the most healthy way, right? So we're still on the roller coaster because we didn't get off it earlier, right? In that navigation stage. And that was when we had the opportunity to, but now our system is adapting poorly. Now our system is noticing things that have been going on a little bit longer right so maybe now we've got difficulty sleeping every night instead of some nights maybe our confidence is at an all-time low maybe the the uh, uh, fast heart rate is now turned into panic attacks maybe some um bad days have turned into some chronic overthinking or negative thinking right this would show that we are at kind of that stage four right we've adapted now to this way of being and then internally inside of our body, it brings us to stage five, which is what we would call our tipping point, right? And this is 
what we get to when enough is enough, right? It's when we continue to neglect all of those things already mentioned, right? And we choose not to process it. All of this stress starts to stack up and compounds, right? And then we repeat the um, stages of the kind of the roller coaster that I've already described over and over again. Then we get more stress, right? And then we get more, we, we challenge to navigate that stress in a healthy way. We don't do that. So now we adapt poorly again, right? And we just continue adding it up, adding it up. And as we do that, we start to have more like emotional outbursts or we call them like stress explosions. We start to question everything. This is when we're going to start to experience chronic pain, snapping at loved ones more severely than perhaps what we did before. Right. Maybe this is where you start to um, have impulsive decision making as well. Maybe relationships start to suffer. Ultimately, you feel like you're drowning at this stage, right? You're at this tipping point, And often this is where an onset of depression or helplessness can start to show up right but our tipping point is another opportunity for us to actually process before we burn out right and stage six is the burnout it is what we've been talking about commonly described as rock bottom like i described earlier this is when our mind body and heart is completely depleted right and sometimes the the resources are a little bit harder so just know that this is a very natural journey right it's so natural to be on this roller coaster and go from ticking away autopilot like you know just almost like ignorance is bliss to some extent and and just getting on with life and then we have something stressful happen right and then we have this opportunity to navigate and go one way or another right but the roller coaster perhaps takes us into poor navigation right and unhealthy coping mechanisms so we dip a little bit and then we try to adapt but we can't and now we're pushing up here we're pushing up on this roller coaster and it's not as effective as what it could be and now we're feeling like we're almost like running at half our capacity and at that point we then hit a tipping point and then boom down we go um, on that roller coaster into burnout so the reason for sharing all of that with you is because it's very very common this journey this roller coaster is so so common and the good news is is that if we're aware of this journey and this roller coaster then we know how to get off of it right so ideally we get off the roller coaster early right as soon as that onset of stress occurs and we're in that navigation phase ideally we get off of the roller coaster but unfortunately many of us don't right and as we stay on the roller coaster right on the way to burnout we then actually start to reveal more core issues behind burnout right so behind the this 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 piece of burnout there are six core things to pay attention to so again, make a note of these, okay? And I'm going to do perhaps some more episodes on these six individually as well. So it's a bit easier to digest and so that I can go into it in more detail. But for now, just having your awareness of these six are going to be really important because our awareness of these six helps us to overcome burnout as we continue on the path. So the first one is lack of awareness and regulation. This is usually a core issue. So basically, our nervous system starts to get stuck, right? It gets stuck into a certain state. So imagine that your nervous system is like a symphony, right? When the stresses are at play and it's too loud, it disrupts the harmony that is inside your system, right? We need to regulate the nervous system like a skilled conductor, right? Balancing the instruments and ensuring this beautiful composition. This is what we need to do. We need to bring our nervous system back from burnout and bring it into a state of repair and recovery the second core issue right after a dysregulated nervous system is looking at unresolved past experiences so i mentioned on the roller coaster example that stress adds up stress compounds and actually when we're burned out it gives opportunity for all past stresses and emotions to come up as well so if you imagine that you have been like collecting all these little stresses for your whole life you've been picking them up and you've been putting putting them in your backpack one little rock after another into that backpack little rocks of stress as you go it can be big things little things over time and when we get to the point of burnout that backpack is too heavy and it will pull you down right and all of a sudden all of these rocks all of these past experiences fall out right and at that point we need to start to resolve some of these issues because the, if we don't resolve those issues, often we stay stuck in that state of burnout. So the third core issue that burnout can start to represent or is behind burnout is a mismatched value system. 
right? If you imagine that your values are like a, a compass needle, right? You've got a compass in front of you. And when your values are aligned, it's very clear. You know what direction you're going in, right? You can read the compass easy. But if you have your values, your personal values and what's important to you in life, and they are mismatched and you're, you're not living in alignment to those values. It's like that needle on the compass just spinning in different directions. We don't know where we are. We don't know if we're coming or going. Right. So by aligning our values, we actually start to um, like get on the same page. Right. And your compass can start to take you where it is you need to go, providing clear direction for your life and reducing any kind of inner conflict that is wasting energy that could be contributing to your burnout recovery. The fourth issue that I see around burnout is our ability to feel safe inside and outside of the body. We get stuck into this state where we feel like we're under threat or we feel like we're stuck. We go into this primal survival zone. And when we're in that space, it's like we're constantly being chased by a lion, even though we're not and we're safely at home in our own space. Right. So our ability to feel safe becomes compromised. So we need to start to look at how do we learn to feel safe inside of our body how can we make sure our environment is safe and that you're recognizing and you can can sense that it's safe as well that's one of the kind of antidotes to being able to feel safe inside your body the fifth core issue is physical needs being met right and that is physical shelter right making sure that you are in a safe space making sure that you can process and absorb nutritious food right? Making sure that you um, are hydrated, making sure that you, you're putting some good fuel into this system to keep the energy running, right? Our physical needs are probably one of the first things that starts to slide when burnout creeps in because self-care starts to get neglected. But it's happened so gradually, we don't always notice it. And even if you do start to pick up on it, you think, oh, I'm going to eat a bit healthier now because I'm feeling tired, I'm feeling depleted. And you're recognizing some of those symptoms, if we're already too far down the rabbit hole, it doesn't matter how much healthy food you eat, your body cannot absorb it because your stress hormones are so high, right? And your adrenals and your, your digestive system, it's all depleted so much that it's now all out of balance that we need to start to get it back into balance. So if you feel like you've been trying, you've been trying your best to meet your physical needs, but it's just still not working, there is a chance that you need to seek some professional support here as well. And last but not least, OK, the biggest core issue that I see that is linked to burnout and the cause of it and the solution, the recovery of it is fulfilling our six psychological needs. So psychologically, we need to have a sense of certainty, variety, love and connection, significance, the need to feel importance, growth and contribution. If these six psychological needs are not being met over a prolonged period of time, we can start to feel really, really bad. And combined with the other five that I've just mentioned, it's a very, very slippery slope. So these are just the core issues that we've noticed. Now, the good news is, is when we are aware of these core issues, we can start to actually unpack them. Now, you're more than welcome to go back and listen to this part of this episode and really reflect on what those six mean for you. However, I do recommend that if that sounds overwhelming and and it's okay if it does that you may want to explore these issues with a professional okay it's highly highly recommended and if you are in a state of absolute burnout and you feel like you are struggling right now please reach out to somebody that can support you whether it be a therapist a psychologist a stress relief special specialist if it's somebody um, that you just know like and trust reach out to them it's an amazing first step okay but I know you want more, right? I know I've been talking for a while now, but I promise you um, the next five steps is how you can now start to overcome burnout from where you are right now. Things that you can start to do. So step one is recognize and own it. One of the biggest issues with burnout and why we stay in it for so long is because we're almost in denial. We don't want to admit that there's something wrong or we don't want to change things in our life because it's sometimes easier to stay in that discomfort and in that pain right and also sometimes there's a bit of shame in admitting defeat like I need help but the reality is it's like 
there's no shame in asking for help. If anything, that's the massive sign of strength. And the minute we're able to recognize and own it, then well, then we get to change, right? That's the needle mover. That's the bit that changes the game. So step one, if you recognize burnout in everything I've been talking about today, own it. Literally write it down on paper. I am experiencing burnout right now. I am experiencing this symptom. That's a symptom. I am feeling burned out, right? Just own it. Because from there, you can then do step two, which is to prioritize recovery. Right now, the duration of burnout recovery varies from person to person. There's a lot of data to support that we don't actually recover from burnout until about 18 months after right, the onset. So it can be a long path. It can be a shorter path, of course, as well. But your ability to own where you are and then to choose to prioritize it, even if you don't know how you're going to prioritize it yet, just choose that is going to be a factor that you're going to focus on. That's going to help no end. Step three is to communicate your needs. Okay. Now this could be maybe time that you need. It might be people that you need to speak to. It might be resources that you need. It might be, um, it might be a short break, right? To, to start the process of your recovery, communicating what you need to yourself and then to somebody that can support you is going to be extremely powerful. And that might be a partner, that might be a friend, that might be a work colleague, that might be a boss, it might be HR. Communicate your needs as best you possibly can. Step four is self-compassion. I mentioned shame and embarrassment and perhaps a negative thought pattern, all right, associated with what you're experiencing. Meeting ourselves with compassion is so important, so powerful, because there's no point you kicking yourself while you are down, right? We do so much better when we are spoken to from a place of love and we are experiencing acts of love, right? But that comes from self, not just things and people around you. So perhaps being a little bit kinder to yourself, allow yourself the space to prioritize your recovery. Allow yourself a hot soak in the bath and put in something that's pending down for a moment. Sit with your thoughts, sit with your feelings as if they're a small child and ask yourself, what would you say to them? Sometimes it's a really easy way to tap into compassion. Step number five is to address the physical health first. Okay, so depending on your symptoms, recommending obviously a doctor, um, but looking at different lifestyle tweaks that you can make, increasing your water intake, increasing your nutrition um, or nutritious foods, movement, getting fresh air, taking moments to breathe, address your physical health first, because as soon as our energy starts to pick up a little bit and we've got that solid foundation, we can then go and start to unpack those six core issues that I mentioned earlier. Now, I'm very aware that that is a lot of information. So just pause for a moment, breathe, take it, take those steps in and just ask yourself, which step are you ready to take? And take it one step at a time. All right. So our team have actually developed a diagnostic scorecard where you can actually see exactly what you need. It will measure how you're doing day to day, how your body is coping, where your stress or burnout is stemming from. And in less than two minutes, it will generate a report for you, which will highlight exactly what you're doing well right now, and then actionable tips on how to improve immediately as well. So once your score's been calculated, you'll get that tailored report straight to your inbox, and it's completely free. It's been designed to help, nothing more, nothing less. I remember, you know, when I experienced burnout, I wish I'd had access to a tool like this, because at least I would have had a starting point right so that's kind of our gift to you off the back of staying into the in this uh, episode for so long um but what's really really important is that you know that overcoming burnout is a gradual process but one that feels like a weight's being lifted like there's this this like mental haze this fog it will start to lift i promise you that and uh, maybe you're thinking you don't have time for it but it was uh, jim goodwin that once said if we don't have time that is the time we need to do it the most right that's the time 
That is the time. That is the sign. That is the signal. Prioritizing your recovery is going to allow you to start feeling connected to yourself, to those you love again. You'll be able to feel energized and engaged in your life again in the ways that you enjoy. You'll be thinking clearly and able to perform again in the ways that you want to. And you'll have a confidence that you can just step into the world again. Right. And you will know yourself again and you'll find that zest of life again. All right. So to wrap up, overcoming burnout is about listening to your experience of it physically, mentally and emotionally. Keep an eye on your red flags. OK, and seek help when needed. Consider what stage of burnout you are on that roller coaster. Reflect on your core issues that are underpinning burnout and give those five immediate steps a try. I am thinking, like I said, of doing a separate episode for each of the six core issues that are underpinning in burnout, like I mentioned, um, and more specific episodes on the different types of burnout also. So let me know what you want, and I'll make sure these episodes are created especially for you. All right. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time, please be well. If you enjoyed this episode and you haven't done so already, hit that subscribe button so you never miss an episode. Then share it with a friend who you think might benefit. Spread the word. That's how we're going to impact the world by helping each other. We appreciate you so much and as always, unconditional love and wellness to you.